Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing story of Pensacola, North America's first place city. And today we're beginning, going to begin a tale of somewhat what I call our antique buildings. Now, this is rather an odd story because while we are a city that can trace its ancestry back to 1559 or then to 1698 and then beyond, we have precious few really old structures. And in this, uh, these episodes, we want to tell you a little bit about some of those that have been the most prominent and have had some little place in the history of the community. Of course, we, we can look at the, at the areas right now that are prominent in residential reconstruction, particularly up on North Hill, where we have a wonderful series of uh, buildings that were built anywhere between 1880 and the early part of the uh, 20th century, and where a, a North Hill Preservation Society has done wonderful work in bringing those buildings back to look just what like what they did back when they were constructed in the in the great part of the lumbering era. But uh, from the one the buildings that are actually our oldest, we have to turn to some replicas first of all. Now one of the buildings that we can remember most of in our history here was the Panton and Leslie Warehouse. This was down on the waterfront. It was where the Panton and Leslie trading post uh, stored the materials that it traded with the Indians. Uh, it was it stood there for a good many years until it's it's, it's burning uh, not too many years ago. And we have today a little replica of it, just a, mid, a, a, a miniature model actually, that, that is down on Main Street. It helps people understand where the warehouse was and it, and it gets an idea of what it looked like. Then we turn to, to an ap, actual uh, 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 existing uh, building, which is called the Julie Cottage. It's in the historic district down just uh, just east of uh, Tarragona Street. And Julie was a the slave of uh, the, lumber, the uh, fur uh, trader Robert, Robert Pan. Patton, uh, William Patton, and uh, she was she was freed when Patton left the area in, uh, in the year 1800, and he gave her $300 with which she bought this house, and of course she used it to great advantage, and happily it has been preserved. Next, we would turn to, to one of our premier uh, preserved homes called the Barclay House. It, is, it stands on, uh, on, uh, Ma on Main Street, the beautiful building, constructed probably about 1849 or 50 by a, a, a couple who were just settling in here to, uh, to develop the, uh, a, a trade business of their own, and Mr. Barclay was, the, uh, was also a, a government commissioner. The house itself is, is kind of unique because it's called a, a Gulf High House. It, is, it follows a pattern that was very popular along the Gulf Coast, particularly over near New Orleans, because if one would look at it, you can see that the, the living area is well raised above the water level in case storms should come. And the, the house has been restored a number of times and currently is the property of the historic village and the University of West Florida. Well, if, you look, if we look in our historic district itself, which includes a great many buildings in the lower part of the city, there are many houses which were constructed anywhere from 1875 forward. Some of these are what are called shotgun houses. A shotgun house was one which uh, got that title because it had a, a long hall that ran right uh, from the entrance do door on the front. And one could literally, as someone used to say, you could shoot a shotgun down that hall and not, and not hit anything except the hall itself. All the rooms were off to the side. They were, this was a very popular, uh, inexpensive type of construction. And there are a good many examples here. But in, that, in the historic village, there are also a number of others much more uh, pretentious homes, and these were popular places to live up until about the uh, beginning of the 1880s when people began to make more money and wish to have better housing. Well, there are some, of course, some other things that we want to look to downtown. Number one, of course, is Old Christ Church. This church was built as a multi-denominational effort between Presbyterians, Baptists, B Methodists, and Episcopalians, all of whom pull up uh, pooled their resources and erected the church and it became effective as the first Protestant church in all of Florida and it became effective for use here in 1832. It was totally re uh, renovated not too many years ago uh, with more than a million dollars spent in the restoration and it is a beautiful landmark for, th for the city. Uh, another building that doesn't exist anymore, I wish it did, but uh, we had a, a, a down at the corner of Palafox and Government Street. In 1851 they erected the first federal 
old building that we ever had built here in Pensacola. It was a combined customs house, a courthouse, and post office. It was a wooden structure, two and a half stories high, and it stood there for about 30 years. It burned in 1881 and then was replaced by a uh, much larger four-story sandstone building, which was erected again for, as a federal courthouse and which uh, the federal government continued to use up until the year uh, 1939 and 40 when they traded that building to the county. And the county in turn traded to them the county courthouse, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in just a few minutes. Now, other, other structures that came into being in the early part of the 1870s in the, uh, in the downtown area uh, are, are typified by what we now call the Door House. This was, uh, this was built by uh, the daughter of the Barclays who uh, had, had, had owned the Barclay House. Uh, the daughter was a widow. Uh, her husband had worked for the, uh, for the large Simpson uh, lumber mills over in, the, in Santa Rosa County. When he died, uh, she used uh, residue from his estate to build this lovely house for her family and it is, has been beautifully preserved and is one of, again, one of the landmark houses, a, a much uh, one of the, the best looking homes that we have down in the early in the era, downtown part of the historic district. Now, in 1885, we had what was probably the great landmark construction item of, our, of that time, and that was the building of the Pensacola Opera House. This was the product of, the, of an idea of the two, uh, 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 two banking uh, uh, brothers, the Sullivan brothers, and they built a huge building on the corner of, Ter of uh, Jefferson Street and government, and the building was, uh, first of all, to, on one corner to house their bank, and right in the center and above, of course, was to be the opera house. And it all, this building also had second floor uh, space for, uh, for, for other functions. And this is where, for a time, the Jewish Progress Club was located. And also, in a, beginning in 1889, this is where our first Chamber of Commerce had its office. The opera house was magnificent. It began with about 1,000 seats. It was enlarged to have about 1,250. And then for the next 35 years, this was the center of culture for our community. It was a beautiful building. Unfortunately, uh, hurricanes damaged it seri seriously so that it was raised in uh, 1917. But happily, much of the uh, brickwork and all of the, uh, a lot of the interior trim was saved by the, uh, by the uh, contractor who did the re demolition work. And much of that material, including the brick, was used when they uh, constructed the Sanger Theater about seven years later. And when one walks down the street and looks at the Sanger today, much of the brickwork that you would see from the outside is still from the Opera House, and a lot of the decoration you would see as you look upward and around the walls on the interior of the, uh, of the theater itself, that again was taken from the Opera House. Well, if we look a little bit further, we can get another sample uh, in downtown Penn, or in the, in the North Hill area, of what the people began to do when they began to make money. And one of the best examples of this is on the corner of, uh, of Balin Street and Strong. This is where the, Turner, the uh, contractor, uh, Charlie Turner, built his home uh, that was to be his home where he literally took his bride uh, on, their honey, on their marriage night. The, the, Turner, the Turner house is a beautiful home right on the corner. It's painted gray today. It's owned by his, by Turner's grandson Bill, who also owns the building just to the to the south of there on along Balin Street, which Bill uses, of course, as a uh, headquarters for his antique shop. Now, the the Charlie Turner house is unique in that when he built it, he not only made a wonderful home for himself and his wife, but also he used that house as as a kind of a uh, well, kind of a show place. And the the story goes that he changed the interior staircase four times in the life of the, of the house itself because he wanted to be able to show people who were, are his potential customers for new homes just what was the latest thing to be built in new architecture and he could take them inside and show them not only the construction styling but also colors and, and fabric and also the, the, hard, the various types of woodwork that was available and this was again Charlie Turner's uh, uh, well, his, his, uh, his premier bu building, we would say, of all the things that he did. Another, one that, uh, another building that unfortunately does not exist anymore was known as Rayford Hall. Rayford Hall was built in the 1880s on North Balin Street to be a kind of a health club for some of the wealthy men of the area. It was later given to a, a civic organization, and they used it for the, basically the same services. And it had many different uses, but unfortunately it burned here in the 1980s. However, one can get a pretty good idea of what, the, of what Rayford Hall looked like, because just a few years later, the Port of Pensacola, or rather the LNN Railroad, built a, a, a port office for itself right on the docks at the foot of the Commandantia Street. And then in the 19... 
In the 1980s, when Fort, port reconstruction was underway, the port had that building demolished a piece at a time, and then it was rebuilt along Main Street. And the building is now beautifully restored and is in use by an archaeological society. And certainly when one looks at that and then looks to get, wants to have an image of what the Rayford Hall was like, the two are very much the same. Now, another thing that we want to look at, of course, downtown is a couple of the churches. They are certainly our our antique buildings of distinction. Number one, of course, we would look at would be St. Michael's. St. Michael's was built by uh, the Catholic uh, uh, diocese here in 1883. Uh, Charles Overman was the architect for this. It was a Spanish mission style, and at the time it was built, it cost over $33,000, which people thought was terribly extravagant, but as one can see, that church now has, has withstood the test of time, and in, after 125 years, is a beautiful landmark downtown. Uh, just up the street from there, of course, we have the, uh, the second uh, Christ Church. This is what a lot of people call New Christ Church. This was developed, this was uh, erected in 1903, once the largely the uh, Episcopal congregation had moved away from old Christ Church, was moving steadily north, and uh, led by the, uh, by the patriarch of the, uh, of the uh, Barr's family, money was raised, and uh, Christ Church was erected in 1903. And of course, there have been many additions to this in other big uh, structures to provide education and other things for that congregation since then. Moving just a little bit to the, to the east of there, along Wright Street, one comes to the First United Methodist Church. This church was a, uh, uh, put there in 1910 once the congregation sold its properties, which had been right on the corner of Palafox and Garden Street. Uh, they sold their properties to the men who wanted to build the San Carlos Hotel. The, uh, Mr. Bingham and Mr. Mulden gave the, uh, the stewards of the Methodist Church $30,000 for their buildings and property, which they, the stewards in, uh, pro uh, subsequently invested in this beautiful new uh, sanctuary, which uh, unfortunately uh, they overspent on and it took about 20 years before the congregation had it all paid out, but um, restored on a number of occasions. It is a beautiful uh, landmark building that certainly tells the story very well. Now, practically next door to that is what we call the Perry House. Now, the Perry House was built in stages. It was the dream of a Danish ship captain who came to Pensacola in the 1860s. He saw what he what he uh, he, he saw the, Pens the the city of Pensacola. And he thought this was a place he wanted to live. He bought this property and began construction, but unfortunately he died before it could be completed. It was sold, then sold again, sold a third time, and ultimately in the in the mid years of the uh, of the uh, 1920s, it was uh, it was sold or given. There's a little bit of a question on how that worked to the to the Masonic order and they in turn operated it as their home and headquarters until very recently when it was sold to the United Methodist Church, which in the, then the church stewards there, of course, have been in the process of remodeling it and use it to be used, the building would be used for church services and for many other purposes as well. Okay. Well, let's move down south on Palafox Street for just a moment, down up right to the just above where the auditorium used to be, where DeLuna Park has been established now. And we come on the on the east side of the street is a long, narrow house, which we today, what some people call the Bars House, some others call the Merritt House, but basically it was a building erected in the early 1870s by Henry Bars as his office for his maritime agency. And he operated it for many years, but then in the early part of the 1990s, as Henry was moving into other areas. He, he, the Bars family, sold it to John A. Merritt and Company, and Merritt and Company used it, of course, as their headquarters well up into the 1970s, when ultimately they sold out to an organization for Mobile. Unfortunately, the building has stood uh, idle for some time, but it is still there in a wonderful uh, replica of the kind of business building that people like to, to associate with the, the lumbering era because it was very functional, and of course, in its time, it had a, an a available uh, stairway down to the very water level so that people could bring a boat right up to the side of the building. Well, this gives us an idea of, in episode one here, many of the earlier buildings that were constructed here. In episode two, we'll, we'll return and talk a little bit more about things of a little more modern era and how these have progressed.